the lesson that I prepared uh, 48 hours ago. Uh, so, <laughs> so what am I supposed to teach tonight? And that's fine. Uh, so, but, uh, so I went and looked at some old outlines that I had done back in 2010, 2011, and uh, said, well, you know, I've taught that before. I'll pull that out and be able to do that. And it's amazing when that much time passes and you look at something that you've done and you look at it and you say, <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking or, <laughs> or I think differently about that now, uh, these, these kinds of things. And so what I, I decided that I would do then is I would say, you know, what's fresh on my mind is the lesson that I prepared and taught just on Sunday about music. Uh, but I, I, I didn't really want to teach a sequel to that lesson about music. There, there's other things that we can talk about, and you can, you can flesh that lesson out to, to be many other topics. Uh, but I, I felt that maybe they would be less spiritually edifying. And, uh, but there was something that I, I kept hitting on in that lesson on Sunday, it, which was that singing and music is, is something that God has prescribed for the church, the body of Christ, to participate in and to participate in together. And that, that's clear from, from the scripture. But what I was trying to show was that it was in a, in a long list. It was in a context of a greater picture of what should be going on. Yeah. It wasn't just a command to do this, even though it was a command to do this. It was a command in a greater context. And so that is what uh, the outline you have tonight is about, is exploring that greater context of the three passages in which we find the places where Paul talks about music. So tonight's lesson is not about music, but it comes from the idea that music was a tool that God has given the church to participate with and to use to edify the body. Amen. And that, I'm going to try to coin something here, uh, I, the edification of the body is a great way to sum up the will of God. And we, we use uh, 1 Timothy 2.4 often, right? God's will is to see all men saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Those are the only two ways that the body can be edified. Yes. The body being edified is the body of Christ, the spiritual new creature that God has created in this dispensation uh, for those who are saved by grace through faith in the work that Jesus Christ did on their behalf to seat them in heavenly places for eternity and, and give them glory as joint heirs with Christ. Amen. And so when someone trusts that they're a sinner for whom Christ died and rose again, then they are placed into this spiritual new creature, the body of Christ. And edification of that body means that it is being built up. In the word edification, you see the word edifice, like a building, like to build. And so when you edify something, you are building it up. You're, you're either making it bigger or making it stronger. You're fortifying it. And those are the two things that Paul describes as God's will in 1 Timothy 2.4. Seeing all men saved is making the body of Christ bigger, right? Yeah. So you put another person in, you put another person in, and now the body of Christ is being edified because it's being bigger and bigger. And then when you see people come to the knowledge of the truth, then each of those, each of those people that are coming to that knowledge are getting spiritually stronger and yeah. spiritually bigger, and now the building is getting more fortified and strengthened and thus also being edified. That's, the, that's where the word comes from. The edify is to build up. And so we're either going to build it in strength or, or, or in number, right? Strength would be the knowledge and the spiritual growth. Number would be the mere salvation of souls. And so ideally you have both. You're adding souls by seeing them saved and you're seeing those souls grow in strength and knowledge and spiritual understanding. And thus you are edifying the body of Christ. Now there are other places in the scripture where uh, uh, God, it talks about what God's will is today, um, like abstaining from fornication and knowing how to possess your vessel, being thankful in all things are specifically described as being God's will for the body of Christ today. But again, if you consider my proposition to you that you could sum up God's will as being edification of the body, they fall in line with that. When you are more thankful, then you are going to grow spiritually. And when you know how to possess your vessel, probably because you've grown spiritually some already, that has great effects on the work that can be done and the effect that it has on other people around you. So again, a building up of the body of Christ. So for all intents and purposes, God's will is to edify the body. That's what he wants done. And when you look at Paul's epistles from that perspective, then all of a sudden there, you see a greater context going on 
especially in parts of Paul's epistles where it just seems like he's listing all these just niceties about Christianity. And these happen typically towards the latter half of his epistles. So in Paul's epistles, he usually starts out uh, the, the, the first half or the first portion where he's kind of laying a doctrinal foundation and he's teaching things. And then the latter half of the epistle, it seems to be like instruction in righteousness. And we know that the scripture is good for both of these things, right? All scripture is given and doctrine and reproof and correction and instruction in righteousness, it's all, it's all there. So Paul is providing all these things. But the instruction in righteousness just kind of all, sometimes seems like a big list of things. It's like, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this. And doesn't that sound kind of like a law? Yeah, it does. But if you understand the greater context, it seems a lot less like that. It, because it's not like that. So what I have on your outline here, which is not an outline at all, actually. Um, it, I, I took the scripture from those, those places, and I highlighted key phrases that will hopefully point you to the context of what Paul is trying to communicate in those chapters, right? Now, what I'm not saying here is that it's okay just to remove parts of Scripture and you don't need that and chop that out. That's not what I'm saying. But when you talk about finding a context, you have to learn to look at a passage and you have to say, okay, this is a main point here that he's making. This supports that point and describes that point, but it's not, that's not like the main point. It can be summarized with this statement right here. And so I can, I can kind of ignore that for a second to try to figure out main point to main point to main point. It's kind of like our regular outlines, which I don't have in front of me at the moment. Uh, if you took outlining in, uh, in English or grammar class in school, you know that uh, you start with a main subject here. And then the second main subject you're going to talk about is here. And the third main subject you're going to talk about is here. And then you start to create what we call an outline. Why do we call it an outline? Because when you have the outline of something, you can kind of start to see what it is, unless you're a terrible artist, right? So you have the outline of something, and this is, oh, okay. So it's the, uh, it's the please slow down turtle that you see on the side of the roads, kids present, please slow down. You see those? But the, 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 outline, the outline gives you the idea of the shape of what the thing is, okay? When you're talking about text, we make an outline so that you can see what the main points and the, the train of thought is that the writer or the speaker is trying to communicate. You guys, you guys look at this like you've never seen it. You get one twice a week, right? It's like there's outline. And then, oh, you say, well, I've got something to say about that main point. And you say, well, that's the, like sub point A, right? And then I actually have two things to say about that. So there's going to be an A and a B. But I actually have this other point that I want to make about point A, and, and point B actually has two things I want to say. And so you say these things. Is the outline, it shows you what's more important and what is not unimportant, but it's just like expounding upon or more detail about. But the, the visual representation of the thought process is what an outline is, right? And so what I've, what I've tried to do here is without using all of the ones and A's and lowercase Roman numerals and all of that, is I've tried to create an outline for you of those three passages, 1 Corinthians 14, Ephesians 5 and 6, Colossians 3 and 4. And the way I've done that is I've, this is text from the scripture that's on your page. And I have excised all of the fine detail that exists in and amongst this text to leave you hopefully with some sort of way to see a train of thought on what Paul is trying to communicate. This is particularly helpful in 1 Corinthians 14. When I say 1 Corinthians 14, does anybody get nervous? They, if, you, if you don't, that's good. You're either, you're either ignorant or, or you can handle it, no problem. Right? But a lot of people struggle with 1 Corinthians 14 because it's about how to speak in tongues in the church. Like, that's what people say it's about. Now, what I'm going to show you tonight is that that's not Paul's point. Amen is how to speak in tongues. But that's what, the, when you read 1 Corinthians 14, that's where everybody gets tripped up. So when you ask somebody to make an outline of 1 Corinthians 14, they're like, uh, tongues and uh, prophesying and, uh, what's it? Oh, women, silent. That's the other one. That's the other one. That is the summary of 1 Corinthians 14. Like you ask, you ask somebody, just, just ask them to open the Bible. They don't have to do it from memory. Just ask them to open their Bible 
and, and have them read through it and say, give, give me a summary of what Paul was talking about. And I'll guarantee you they'll list at least two of those three things. Right. So, so this is what sticks out as the main topic. But what I hope to show you here on the outline, that that is not the main topic. And whenever we look at context, you have to first zoom out. Now, context, you're already zooming out. That's the idea of context. You're saying, I'm going to get out of the, the uh, what is it? You missed the forest for the trees. So you're in there looking at leaves, and you want to get context. You've got to zoom out a little bit, right? But even then, you probably need to get a running start. Maybe it drives some of you people crazy, but there'll be a verse on an outline, and the guy up front says, please turn to this verse. And then you get to that verse. And then the guy up front starts reading two or three verses beforehand. You're like, would you? Because you didn't know that's what he was going to do. And so you're staring at that verse. And you're like, that's not what my Bible says. And all of a sudden, he starts reading the verse you're looking at. And you're like, oh, whew, I, get, I get it. He started two or three. You're used to it now. Yeah. You're used to it now. So you've got like the whole page ready. You're like, he's going to jump in anywhere in there. You get it? I sit out there too. I understand how it is. <laughs> But why do we do that? Because it's easy to cherry pick a verse. It's easy to just pick any verse you want and say, hey, this is what I want to say. But if it doesn't fit in the context, then you're probably using it wrong. Amen. And so we jump back a little bit, a few verses beforehand, to give us a running start of uh, what the context is so that we can better digest that verse, to better understand what it means. So we're zooming out on 1 Corinthians 14. And the first thing we're going to do is back up to the end of 1 Corinthians 13. And what I want to point out here is it says that uh, in verse 10, we'll start in, in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 10, and we really will start in verse 10. It says, when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, there's other things in, that, for we know in part and prophesy. Like, that's the stuff that, that gets people tripped up. But the point you have to take away from this is when I became a man, I put away childish things. That's the most important thing that he says in those first three verses, yeah. Right? Uh, or verses 10 through 13, except for, I think, the last thing that he says is also important, which is the greatest of these is charity. It doesn't really even matter what the others are, even though those are good. Charity, obviously, I mean, if you want to know the greatest thing, we're already talking about what's the point, and he just tells you the greatest thing is charity. Amen. So what's, what is the, the, the point of his, of his uh, letter that he's writing here at the end of 1 Corinthians 13 is that there's something about growing up putting away childish things, and understanding that the greatest thing is charity. That's, that's the point of these last three verses of 1 Corinthians 13. And then you get to 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. Now, it's hard to not treat chapter numbers and even verse numbers sometimes as some sort of definitive break. But when you're trying to find context and summarizing, remember... Paul did not write a textbook. None of these letters are textbooks. They're letters. He sat and wrote a letter to a group of people to read straight through. He wrote no numbers. He didn't start every sentence on a different line or whatever, however your Bible formats it. That's not how he wrote a letter. That you, like you would get a letter in the mail if that happens anymore. And you would, you would open it up and they would read the letter just from top to bottom. And no doubt they would go back and want to study it, and they'd want to learn more about what it said. And so as that happens over time, they say, you know, this would be a lot easier if we could organize this a little bit. And so they put the numbers in. They put the chapters in. But Paul never wrote those numbers and chapters. Those things are not inspired in your scripture. You need to know that. So when you end a chapter, it's highly likely that the first verse of the next chapter is somehow related to the last verse of the previous chapter. Highly likely. And in this case, we see that to be as well. Because in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, what's the first three words? Follow after charity. Well, what have we been talking about in 1 Corinthians 13? The greatest thing is charity. So follow after charity. And then it says desire spiritual gifts. And this is where people start to, whoa, wait a minute. Like, are we putting this as a main point here? Well, he, he is talking in the context of what he's writing is they had spiritual gifts given by God through the Holy Spirit to establish the church at Corinth. They had that. that. The whole conversation about spiritual gifts is a different topic. But notice what he goes on to say about the spiritual gifts. So if you have a hang-up with spiritual gifts, just put a pause on that thought and see that Paul is trying to communicate something about the spiritual gifts that's way more important than the spiritual gifts themselves. 
How do I know that? Because he just said the most important thing is charity, follow after charity. And now let me tell you what that looks like. That's the rest of the chapter. So in whatever it is that they're doing, tongues, prophesying, whatever, charity is the most important thing. Don't forget that. Charity is the most important thing. So follow after charity, desire spiritual gifts. And then you jump down and he says, he that prophesieth speaketh unto men for what purpose? To edification and exhortation and comfort. So it's not about the prophesying. It's about the function of the prophesying. Like what is the prophesying accomplishing? It's accomplishing edification, which we described earlier as the building up of the body of Christ. So people are going to be strengthened by this. Exhortation, which is like an encouragement to do something with the thing. And comfort, which is like a strength to be able to do it. That's what the prophesying should do. So again, I'm trying to point out that the point and the, the big picture about 1 Corinthians 14 is the greatest thing is charity. When you become a man, you put away childish things, and we're going to follow after that charity. So when you do something, it needs to be unto edification and exhortation and comfort. It says, he, now he goes on for a little while to, com to compare tongues and prophecy, tongues and prophecy, tongues and prophecy. And when you read all the details, what you come up to find is that um, they, they weren't doing it right and it was having a bad effect in the church. It, they, they weren't being performed the way that they should have been performed. And so he's trying to tell them that it's not about the thing itself, it's about what's happening as a result. He that prophesies edifies the church. He's making the point that the prophecy is better because it edifies the church. What's the takeaway there? It's more important that you edify the church. What is that? That speaks to charity, right? Is that you're going to do something for, with the truth to benefit someone else. That's what charity is. That's how he describes it earlier in 1 Corinthians 13. And so whatever you're going to do, if you're going to prophesy, it needs to edify the church. And, and he's, what he's saying in the context is over the people who are tongue-talking, the prophesying is way more edifying. So that's what he'd rather them do, because edification is the most important thing there. And again, if you jump down, what is that, verse 11? <clears throat> that's not the verse I want. It says that the church may receive edifying, right? He that speaketh with tongues, except, the, uh, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. So he says, I would you do this, I would you do that. And people are like, well, Paul says I want him, he wants us to speak in tongues. No, no, no. Paul says that he wants the church to receive edification, right? That's what he says he wants. Specifically to the Corinthians, he's getting on the tongue talkers there. Okay. And then he goes on to say, what shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? So the, the, the rhetorical question here is like, how are you going to get profit? Like, that's the point of coming together. Profit, charity are related, which is interesting uh, when you talk about uh, not profits today and, uh, and, and charities in the worldly sense and this kind of thing. <laughs> but he, he's saying that charity profits people. That's what he's saying. Like, when you do something with the truth to benefit someone else, then they profit from it. Amen. And the body is, is edified. So I'm going to skip this whole section about how the tongues and the words are easy to be understood and what shall be spoken and speaking in the air and all that, because that's not the, that's not the point of what he's trying to say. He says, even so, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gift, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. I think, that, I think what he is saying there is what I've been beating the horse dead with, which is, yeah, you want to talk about spiritual gifts, but Paul wants to talk about edifying the church. So here we are halfway through 1 Corinthians 14, and we're seeing that Paul's consistent theme is the church receiving edification, the church receiving profit, the church being built up. Seek that you excel to the edifying of the church. So whatever you do. In verses 13 through 17, he starts talking about um, praying with the understanding and singing with the understanding. So he, he's kind of clarifying a little bit that this edification has to do with the fact that people can understand something. And then in verse 17, <clears throat> he says that uh, the other is not edified. He's, he's saying, you see how he's saying that as a continuation of the theme of the chapter. It's like if you're doing this or that in this way, then somebody's not being edified. And Paul's whole point is that people be edified. I know this seems kind of redundant at this point, 
But I'm hoping to drive the point home that this chapter is about edification. Amen. The reason why I chose this chapter to talk about is because it, two places in this chapter, Paul actually talks about music, and that was the topic of the conversation in the lesson on Sunday. And we were trying to point out that music is a way to edify people. And I know that because it's in a chapter that talks about edifying people. And he's using it as an example on how to do that, singing with understanding. <clears throat> in understanding be men, right? Is that verse 20? And we also know that we're talking about the corporate church, meaning when people come together, not like when you're just sitting at home. You are the church there too. We're all members in particular. But the, the body of Christ was designed to function better together. Yeah. I've given that example before. You know, your finger is important, and it can do a lot by itself. But your hand can do a whole lot more. When you have five fingers, if you can use your whole arm to do something, you can get a lot more accomplished. If you had two of those things, man, you're really, you're really working. So the point is, yeah, it's important that each of us are members of the body, and we each have a place in the body, but we can do a lot more when we come together. That's all over Paul. So he wants us, uh, he says, when ye come together... Every one of you hath a psalm, has a doctrine, a tongue, a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. <laughs> Are we getting the idea yet, what Paul's talking about? Can you see how, now I'm not cherry picking, and the reason why I know I'm not cherry picking is because I'm not ignoring the context. You can go to the Bible and get a verse to support your position on what you believe. That's allowed. <laughs> What's not allowed is you, for you to go to the Bible and pick a verse to support the position you believe and the verse not really be talking about that. That's not allowed. You can't, you can't take the Bible out of context. That's using the Scripture wrongly and deceitfully. You can't take what God said and twist it to make it say something you want it to say. That is wrong. But you most certainly can and should be using the Scripture to back up what you believe. And so you can cherry pick a verse and use it to support your doctrine if the verse in the context is truly supporting that doctrine. And that's all we've done in this outline here, is we've gone through and we've said, okay, what's the most important thing that Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 14? He seems to keep bringing up that word edification. What I did not do, I did not have time to do a little search on how many times he uses a form of that word in this chapter, because it keeps coming up. And I bet if we analyzed where the word edify or edification or anything of that ilk shows up in Paul's epistles, I bet it would be highly concentrated in these three passages that we're looking at tonight. Which, which tells you that the other things in and amongst those mentions of edification are highly likely to be related to it. It's a supporting uh, thought. It's something that he's elaborating on. So getting to the end of the chapter here, he wants all to learn and be comforted. Where are we at here? Verse... Uh, <clears throat> There it is, 31. For ye may all prophesy one by one. And that's where people stop. Well, we all, well let's take turns, I guess. Uh, why don't you start? <laughs> prophesy one by one. Uh, that all may learn and all may be comforted. Like there's a function behind the thing, right? He wants, the, he wants them to use the thing so that people can learn and be comforted. And then the last thing he says in the chapter, the last verse in this, in this instance, this last verse does end a section of the writing of the letter where in the next verse he moves on to a different topic. And that's not the point of tonight. But it, it, the last verse in verse 14, or in chapter 14 says, let all things be done decently and in order. Amen. Which is kind of the secondary point of the chapter. If, every, if everything that's being done is for the consideration of the benefit of other people to be profited, so that they can have understanding, so the body can be edified and built up and strengthened, then things probably should be happening in an order, in, in an orderly fashion. Okay? And so he sums up this whole chapter. It's like, listen, we're coming together to edify the body, and we need to do that in a decent and orderly way. Yeah. That is 1 Corinthians 14. It's not about tongues. It's not about prophesying. It's not about spiritual gifts. It's so that whatever you do, you do it for the edification of the body, remembering that charity is the most important thing to consider. Yeah. 
It's in that context that two of the times that he mentions music in his epistles are in that chapter. So music clearly is something that he associates with as edifying the body. That's how we come to that conclusion. The second set of uh, chapters to give us context for our lesson from Sunday where we were talking about music and the church and its function today is Ephesians chapter 5. But like I said, to get the context, we're going to back up a little bit. And we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 4. Now, it is not a coincidence that we just studied 1 Corinthians 14, 13 to 14. Does anybody know what the context, or the general topic of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is? You don't have to answer out loud, I'm going to tell you. It's rhetorical. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, talking about the gifts given in the church and the different body parts. Remember that? How does the uh, ear say to the hand and all this kind of business? He's talking about individual body parts, and he has to talk about that because there were spiritual gifts given. And the different gifts were causing some issues with people boasting and not being charitable to others. And so he describes the, he describes the doctrine to the Corinthians to try to teach them and rebuke them about how, listen, God gave these gifts, and he gave them for reasons Right? And that and everybody's a member. Just because they don't have this gift or that gift doesn't mean that there's something the matter with that body part. He's, that's what he's trying to teach them in 1 Corinthians 12. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. And the beginning, towards the beginning of this chapter, <clears throat> in verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. These are spiritual gifts. Ephesians 4, he, start, he starts this section earlier about the one calling and all this, but then he ta starts talking about how God gave some spiritual gifts. And then you jump down here in verse uh, 14, that we henceforth be no more children. Now, wait a minute. What have we just learned in 1 Corinthians 13? When I was a child, spake as a child, but I became a, a man, right? When I became a man, I put away childish things. Do you see a consistent flow of thought from Paul. Now, the first, in 1 Corinthians, he's talking to a different audience, a, a very carnal, uh, spiritually immature audience. But the content is the same. Like, he's walking through the same thought process. Look, there were spiritual gifts given, and we're not children anymore, so we need to become men in our understanding. That's not a, a gender issue. That's like a, a child versus an adult, right? We need to become men in understanding. That's what, We talked about that back in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 13. And here he's doing the same thing in chapter 4. So that's, we start drawing lines and connections and dots and say, okay, I see a train of thought that Paul is laying out here in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. And now I see kind of a condensed version of that in Ephesians 4. He must be talking about the same thing. And lo and behold, we find out that he is. So we, we've got uh, apostles and prophets and gifts in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. We talk about not being children anymore in verse 14, so that we may grow up into him in all things in verse 15. And then in verse 16, we get to the theme, which is the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. There it is again. So what, where did Paul go after, uh, after spiritual gifts and after... Uh, growing up and being men and not children anymore, he went right into considering other people and edifying the church. The whole of chapter 14 in 1 Corinthians was edifying the church. And here we are again in that same order, and he's talking about edification of the church. So, unto the edifying of itself in love. And then in verse 17, he says, This I say, therefore. And so then, because of that edifying itself in love being kind of the chief goal of the church, in verse 16... He goes on, starting in verse 17, to describe what that might look like. Now, I took a little bit of liberty here to try, try to help focus the lesson. He, Paul, in, in his uh, next two and a half chapters here, he gives these instructions on different ways, different tools that God has given us to be able to edify the body. And I wanted to put an emphasis on the positive command to do something, like do this, do that as opposed to the don't do this, don't do that warning. Okay, he gives both. And so I'm not trying to say that, that the, the, the warnings are not important. But for the sake of the edification, I wanted to focus on 
these are the tools that are provided. These are the things that can be done, right? And so that is what's listed on the outline there. He says that uh, in verse 17, walk not as other Gentiles walk. And that is the closest I get to including on this list in Ephesians 4, something that is a warning of what not to do, okay? But the rest of these things are positive commands of things that can be done for the edification of the church. And I've left off the details, but here starting in Ephesians 4, verse 20. So we've, we've got put off the old man, right? That's your flesh. That's who you were before you were saved. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So you've got to learn something in your spirit and then put on the new man, which you've got to reckon that what God said about you is true. And you've got you to walk that way. That's what he's saying in verses 20 through 24. Put off the old man, be renewed in your mind, put on the new man. You can't edify the church if you don't take care of yourself first in that way. Amen. That's why he starts with that. Therefore, I say, don't walk as the other Gentiles. Put off the old man. Be renewed in your mind. Put on the new man. And now you're equipped to start edifying the church. So that's why we have to start with that. That's, he says that's how we've learned Christ is how he puts it. He's like, you, you have to have learned Christ before you can start edifying Christ's body. Amen. You, have to, you have to learn the head before you can figure out how the body is supposed to be built. Ephesians 4, 25 through 27, the sum of it, speak every man truth. So the one thing you can do to edify the body, we were talking about earlier, it's like, I need to start speaking more truth. I need to speak truth. That will only result in an edification of the body. When you're silent about truth, then the body's not going to be edified. That's right. Verse 28. Working now, now, verse 28, people say, that, well, let him that stole steal no more. We want to focus on the guy who stole. That's not the point of the verse. Verse 28, work with your hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. You think that only applies to the guy who stole? Like, no, it applies to everybody. Like, that's what everybody else is doing. The guy who's stealing is not doing that. And so he says, tell the guy to that was stealing, stop stealing, do what everybody else is doing, which is something he teaches in other, where, other places in his epistles, to work with your hands and provide for your own, right, so that you can give to those that need it. And maybe the ones that need it are the ones in your house. Amen. But maybe the ones that are needed, that need it are ones outside of your house. So you work to provide for yourself and for others. You don't steal, right? You work. So the positive command here, and that edifies the body. Because what happens when people don't work and they come and they just want to drain on the body and beg and borrow on the body, you know, that, that's not helping. That, that's, a, that's the flesh getting in the way of what the spiritual things are supposed to be happening. Let not the church be charged and all this kind of business. Like, that's not the church's function. God has given you that responsibility in your spiritual manhood, grown-upness, right, adulthood. Like, that's your job. Provide for your own. Verse 29, communicate that which is good to the use of edifying. A lot of times our communications are not good. And so the positive command is to edify the church, communicate that which is good. Amen. If you can't do that, then what is it Mama used to say? Can't say nothing nice, don't say nothing at all, right? That comes from Paul. Minister grace unto the hearers. Now, that is not uh, manners, although manners are good and nice. Minister grace unto the hearers. Grace is what is reigning today. Grace is what God is doing today. Grace is how God is operating today. So you need to minister grace to the people who are listening to you, right? Not just niceties and politeness. Though there's nothing wrong with that because in the next few verses he says, and be ye kind one to another. Because there's a tendency for people to not be temperate or moderate with these kinds of things, and they swing the pendulum one way. And they say, oh, truth, speak every man truth, communicate that which is good to the use of the edifying, minister grace, doctrine, you got it. Right? Yes, but also be kind to one another, be tenderhearted to one another. You need to be sensitive. That is not to say to be silent. He just said, speak the truth. He's saying being tenderhearted. It's like, consider the other person. Consider what you're about to say or do, how that may affect them in that moment. And sometimes people need a slap in the face. They do. And sometimes that's the most effective way to get somebody's attention. Not a literal slap in the face. Conversational slap in the face, right? It's like something to wake them up, right? So sometimes you need that. But tenderheartedness usually goes a lot further in most situations. I think uh, the brother earlier was saying, the word empathy is not in the Bible, but the concept surely is. And there it is, right? Be tenderhearted to one another. Forgiving one another, 
I joked earlier from Colossians, or uh, Sunday from Colossians, about having the uh, forbearance and forgiveness meeting <laughs> going a long way, forgiving one another. You say, well, this just sounds like a whole bunch of ways to be nice. And all that. Well, we're talking about edifying the body. How can the body be stronger? Well, it's not going to be stronger when people don't forgive one another. It's not going to be stronger when people are holding grudges and people are saying, you know, I'm not going to minister there and I'm not going to do that because that person said this and that and I, he did that and I'm not. Like, that's not edifying to the body. God wants the body edified. Amen. So you're going to need to forgive one another. So, and he continues this whole idea of edification all the way through chapter 5 and chapter 6. That's the whole rest of the book. Right? He culminates in, in, in chapter 4, verse 16, with the point being, now that you've learned all this doctrine about uh, who you are in Jesus Christ and the mystery given to me and all this in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, he lays out some serious mystery dispensation of grace doctrine in Ephesians chapter 1, 2, and 3 in the beginning of chapter 4. And he culminates in verse 16 by saying the whole point of all of this is that the body would be built up and edified. And then he spends the next two and a half chapters explaining what that looks like. Be therefore followers of God. Walk in love, giving of thanks. I already touched on some of those things earlier in the other chapter, but what I'm trying to point out by, that, by saying that is that, do you see the consistency in the topic of conversation in 1 Corinthians 13 and 14 and Ephesians 4 and 5 and 6? He's talking about the same thing, that's why. It's consistent because the topic is edification of the body of Christ. What does that look like? And so, yeah, you see a lot of the same things. And in fact, in, when we go to Colossians, you'll see some of the same things verbatim that he's describing in Ephesians. In Ephesians, he takes a little more liberty to explain some of the nitty-gritty doctrines and, and, and consequences and, and uh, how to do maybe a little bit on some of, those, uh, you know, some of these things that we're just touching on. So a lot of the, uh, the phrases and the verses that I've left out, left off the outline, are those kinds of things. It's like, there, there's a whole lot. You can, I mean, when we go verse by verse, I mean, we, we crawl through these epistles, right? It's like one or two verses a night. And that's, that's appropriate because there's a lot to unpack. But sometimes we need to zoom out and remember to catch the forest and remember those major points that Paul's trying to make. Walk as children of light in Ephesians 5, 5. Walk as children of light. Proving what is acceptable to the Lord. These are two things that, that edify the body. If you've made, been made a child of light, but you're walking as a child of darkness, you're not edifying the body. Right. Proving what is acceptable to the Lord. What do you do when you prove something? You give evidence of it. Right? Prove it. Okay. And you show somebody. Right? Well, this is why. This is how. You know? Oh, you're such a nice person. You know, I don't I have a good example right now. Prove it. <laughs> Whatever it is, prove it. Okay, I'll prove it. I can play the piano. Prove it. Okay, and you go sit down and you play the piano, right? You prove it. Somebody says, I can play the piano. You say, prove it. They're like, ah, I, don't, I don't think I need to do that. It's like, well, maybe you can't play the piano as much as you thought you could or as good as you thought you could. It's like, if you can do it, prove it. And that's what he's talking about here. Prove what is acceptable unto the Lord. Well, I know what's acceptable to the Lord. Prove it. Do it. Let's see it. That edifies the body Amen. because when other people are stepping out of their comfort zone to prove what is acceptable unto the Lord in whatever it is they're doing, that encourages the person next to them to do the same thing. Amen. Ephesians 5 verses 11 through 14, the sum of that is reprove unfruitful works of darkness. That's a positive instruction. That's not don't do the works, which is obviously in there. Reprove them. What does reprove mean? It means to convince someone that it is wrong, right? To make it manifest. Listen, that is incorrect, and here's why. Thus the prove part of reprove, right? You're not just going to call it out, which is part of it. Yeah, you know, that's wrong, that's wrong. Why? Uh, uh, it's wrong. Doesn't matter why. It's just wrong. Not a great ministry, Okay. But if you could say, hey, that's wrong. Why? I'll tell you why. Let's go to the scripture. I'll show you why it's wrong. Like, that's reproving. Because you're providing evidence of the calling out of the thing that's wrong. You might say maybe the calling out is like rebuke. <laughs> it's like, you're going to rebuke. You're going to say that's wrong. And then you're going to reprove. And you're going to show why it's wrong. Right? And then you're going to instruct, correct an instruction right. It's just, you're going to show them what they need to do that is right. Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. 
kind of a lot of things here. And we tend to read them all together, but you could talk for a long time on all of them. Walk circumspectly. Again, what I'm trying to do here is I was just trying to pull out the positive instructions on, on different things that each or some of the members of the body could, uh, uh, can do to edify the body, right? You can walk circumspectly. That means you can pay attention. Yeah. You can live your life like paying attention to what's going on and seeing how maybe you can be most effective for God in that way or maybe seeing what to avoid. It's, it's kind of a, it's a wisdom thing, which we'll get to in a minute. Walk circumspectly. You cannot be wise not walking circumspectly. So if you want to use wisdom that God gives us, you have to be able to look around you. Because wisdom is like, the, uh, it's not just knowing something, it's, it's doing it uh, according to the surroundings in a way that, that God has, uh, has showed us to be the way it needs to be done. It's judgment, discernment. So you got walk circumspectly, redeeming the time, right? which means you've got so much time to live and so you need to make sure you're making the best use of your time. How is that edifying to the body? Well, if nobody redeemed the time, nothing would ever get done for God, for the body. So the body's not edified if people are not redeeming the time. Not redeeming the time looks like you just doing what you do in your old man, or you just doing what you do because it's entertaining or fun, or you not doing what maybe needs to be done because you don't want to. All that is not redeeming the time. So Paul says redeem the time. You can edify the body when you redeem the time. Another thing you can do is understand what the will of the Lord is. A lot of people don't know that. You can be filled with the Spirit. <gasps> Did I just say that? You can be filled with the Spirit. That is a command that Paul gives you that you can do. Unlike, say, the prophesying part. Back in 1 Corinthians 14, you're not going to be able to do that. God is the one that provides the prophecy power through His Spirit through people. He's not doing that anymore today. Topic for another lesson. But you can be filled with the Spirit. So why not? I thought that's what happened at Pentecost. I don't, I don't think we can do that. No, no, you can be filled with the Spirit. You know how? The Spirit spoke a lot of words in this book, and you could be filled with all those words. Amen. But we all tend to fill our heads with other words a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So you can be filled with the Spirit, or you can be filled with whatever else you're going to be filled with. In the example he gives, uh, he, he contrasts it to being filled with, uh, being, to being drunk, right? Well, why is he bring that up all of a sudden? It's like, well, we can't have alcohol? No, the point is, when people get drunk, they have filled themselves to the full with alcohol. Like, you get any more alcohol, and then you're on the floor. Like, so don't be drunk, because with that excess of things for your flesh, instead, be filled with the Spirit, right? Be filled to the brim with this. Just like it's a conscious choice to pick that stuff up and drink it, it's a conscious choice to put this in your head. So, it's in this context that he then says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, I separated that one out from the rest of the phrase because speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs may be different than singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. They could be two different things. They are clearly related. Okay, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs doesn't necessarily require you participate in the doing of the thing. That could be you receiving the thing, right? And I say that knowing that there's a stigma that may or may not be there with like special music and that kind of thing. We tend to not do that here because one, there aren't many people who want to, but, uh, but two, it, it becomes a performance real fast, real quick and easy. Right? And, and it becomes a very fleshly oriented thing and uh, it's about the person doing the performance and not about what it's supposed to be about. And so we tend to avoid that here. But, and, and there's nothing wrong with taking care to make sure that you don't do something that you ought not or go in a direction that you ought not. But what I do want to point out here is that speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs may mean that you're just the recipient of something. Like, if, if, we had, if you had a recording of like the best spiritual song ever, perfectly great, lyrically, and man, the way that it was sung and, and, and recorded, man, that's just like right up your musical alley. You, you love that tune. And then you were able to pop in that cassette tape or drop the needle on that 45. Nobody? <laughs> you, 
turn it on your phone. I don't know. What you, <laughs> click Spotify, Apple Play, whatever. I don't even know what it's called. But you, you, so you're listening to this music, but you're not singing. No. Could you be edified by someone else speaking that hymn or psalm or spiritual song to you via that recording? Yeah, you sure could, right? It could even happen in real life. We just choose not to incorporate it as part of a more corporate setting because of the baggage that comes with it. You know, like a lot of things that we've tried to be careful with about here, around here. So that's okay. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, again, we talked about this earlier before the lesson. Like the, the emphasis here is the in your heart part. The melody here is not necessarily what you hear, though music that is raunchy and sounds bad and represents evil things probably is not the way to be edified in the church. But making melody in your heart, the melody in your heart is a spiritual thing. It's not the melody in coming out of your vocal cords, necessarily. Though there's nothing wrong with that either. Giving thanks always. We talked about thankfulness three times already. Submitting yourselves one to another. This is important because naturally we tend to not do that. <laughs> but... When you have body parts trying to work in conjunction, and they all might try to submit to the head, but if they don't understand how they're going to work together, like it's not going to happen. Right? Everybody could be claiming, well, I submit to Jesus Christ. He's the only one I submit to. That's not wrong, except for the only one part. Because the scripture says, submit yourselves one another. Well, how can you do that? By having the mind of Christ, yeah. like it's described in Philippians chapter 2, where he submitted himself for the good of other people to have to deign something like humanity and flesh and death in order to give everybody else eternal life freely. He submitted himself to you. Like that's kind of the impetus behind the thankfulness. <laughs> It's like he submitted himself to those things for your sake, for our sake. And in that pattern, we submit ourselves one to another. Yet yeah, clearly, we all submit to Jesus Christ. He's our head, right? We're not saying you're God, but he wants us to have his mind, which is to consider the benefit of other people. So you submit your will to their benefit. Amen. Submit yourselves one to another. And that is the verse that nobody teaches on before they jump into the next section. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. That's not so hard if you just got exhorted that we're all supposed to submit to one another. Amen. Right? It's like if we're all supposed to submit to one another unless you're married and then you don't have to submit to your husband. That doesn't make any sense. What he's going to go on to, to describe in the next section is a fleshing out of this submitting to yourselves, uh, submitting yourselves one to another in specific roles that when it occurs edifies the body. The body is strengthened and edified when families are operating correctly. When members of the body of Christ are functioning in society as, say, people who work or people who have people working for them, and they operate by grace with the mind of Christ, like the body is edified because people get saved that way, right? When you're out in doing life, it was my wife and I. We were saved people. And the people that we talked to about the Bible rightly divided and salvation, it's hard. Nobody would listen. I, it doesn't seem like, we, seem like we got nobody saved. We said, you know what? We're switching plans. We're going to make our own. Right? That's our evangelism program. It's like, nobody will listen to me talk. I'll make some people who have to listen to me. Train them while they're young, right? And there you go. I'm being, I'm being lighthearted. The point of the matter is these, in, these are institutions that God created for the benefit of humanity in general, but specifically for the, not specifically, but also for the body of Christ. When families function the way they're supposed to function and marriages function the way they're supposed to function, better things happen. I think we could all agree on that. Like even secularists and atheists could agree on that. Like, wouldn't it be great if relationships were all good? 
Yes, like that's what God intended for relationships to be good, for people to have connections specifically one to another in ways that they can uh, show God's love and grace and that they can uh, benefit society and benefit their household and benefit the church even. Because truth is being communicated in homes where parents are godly and they're trying to commit that to godly children and then the children grow up and they make more babies and all of a sudden you're creating this quasi-army of people who seem to be oriented towards God. Why? Because wives submit to your husbands and husbands love your wives and children obey your parents. Amen. That's all it takes. God has some wisdom. Is it, is it easy? Not necessarily. It's easier when you understand grace doctrine, I'll tell you that. It's easier when you understand grace doctrine because you're the sinner for whom Christ died too. <clears throat> and so God forgave all their sins, but you can't forgive them for not washing the dishes. Like, seriously. <clears throat> we already covered forgiving and forbearing in the previous chapter. Like, that's old stuff by now. So you get all this stuff leading up to Ephesians chapter 5, 22 down as how to edify the body. Like, wives and husbands, this is kind of easy stuff at this point. But he brings it up specifically because these are relationships that God has ordained. Yes. These are relationships that God has made. Now, in the body of Christ, there's no male, female, husband, wife, father, child. That, that in, the, in the body of Christ relationship, that doesn't exist. We're all equal members under the head. Okay? But in our earthly existence, in our earthly vocation, these relationships exist and must exist for life to perpetuate. Especially in a godly way. Yes. Life can perpetuate without these principles. We all see that, right? But that's not how God intended it. God intended it for to perpetuate under these guidelines. And they're not hard, especially if you got Ephesians 4 down with everything we covered there. <clears throat> Ephesians 6, 5 through 9, we covered that with servants and masters. So in Ephesians 6, 10 through the rest of the chapter... Be strong in the Lord. Now, everybody said, well, this is the armor of God part. I love that part, right? It's a great analogy, not the point. It's not the point. The point is be strong in the Lord. Amen. That's the point. We're talking about bigger picture here, okay? Armor of God, yes. It's in here in the details. We need to know what that is. If you're going to put it on, you got to know what it is. Like, don't walk into the equipment room and start grabbing weapons. And, like, you don't even know what you're throwing stuff and pulling triggers. It's like, no, you, no. Learn how to use it and learn what it is. But the point is be strong. And God has provided an armory for you to do that. But the point is be strong. He needs you to be strong. Be strong in the power of his might, which is listed as separate. What's the difference? Well, there's be strong in the Lord. And then be strong in the power of his might. Well, what, what was his power? The gospel to unto salvation is his power. The power to take sinners and turn them into joint heirs with Christ, to give... Uh, life to the dead. I mean, this is power that you have by Christ giving it to you by grace. So it's more specific. Because he wants you to be strong and then realize that what gives you that strength is the power of the Lord. So yes, put on the whole armor of God. That is a point in the chapter, right? Put on the whole armor. And then stand. Yes. That's something you can do to edify the body is stand. When people are falling down, it's a lot harder to do the work that needs to be done because now you got to... Deal with that. And, and that's part of it, right? People fall and, and you help people up and all that. But like, ideally, everybody would be standing strong with the armor on. That's the goal. Everybody's at different levels. But we got that's the goal we're trying to get to. What can we do to edify the body? You can stand. Praying always. That's not the first time that's showed up. Watching thereunto. That's not the first time that's showed up. So you see some things keep popping up that seem to be rather important. At the very end of the letter, this is not a positive command, but it, he, he, brings a, he brings a personal touch back into the end of the letter, which is appropriate for a letter. And we learn something from it. Uh, he says that he wrote this letter that the Ephesians may also know his affairs and how he does. One way you can edify the body of Christ is to communicate. Because that doesn't always happen or it doesn't always happen well. And so the body members need to communicate with each other. That's exemplary. I mean, that's what the Bible, the Bible's God's letter to us, right? That's God's instructions to us. He communicated with us. We communicate with him. We need to communicate with each other. And the function of that is comfort. That's the very last thing he says, right? That he might comfort their hearts. 
when Tychicus brings them the letter about knowing how Paul's doing, like that's going to be a comfort and a strength to the Ephesians. I'm not going to go as slowly through Colossians. It very strongly mirrors what we just read in Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. Some places verbatim, that's not to diminish it at all. That is rather to speak to the importance of it. If God saw fit to repeat something three or four times verbatim in the scripture, I think he wants you to know that thing, right? We tend to get to those sections like, yeah, I read that last week in the other book. <laughs> it's like, no, it's a reminder. <laughs> like, do it. Seek those things which are above. So if we start in Colossians 3, which is the chapter where we find Paul's last musical reference, that's, that's why we're in this lesson tonight, is because of our springboard from Sunday. <clears throat> Seek those things which are above. Set your affections on things above. That's hard to do when you're down here, right? But that's the instruction. How can you edify the body? Why don't you set your sights on the right things? And the whole body benefits from that. And then again, we see, put off the old man, put on the new man. Like that exact instruction from Ephesians. He describes a little bit more about that. Putting on bowels of mercies and kindness and humbleness of mind and meekness and long-suffering. That's more things than what he lists in Ephesians 4. So he gets a little more detail there. And of course, forbearing one another, forgiving one another, and put on charity. Which again, we've seen now in all three chapters, that concept being having some preeminence there. Let peace rule in your heart. How can you get that? Well, God gives you peace with him. Amen. What more matters? If you're setting your affections on things above, I don't think much would. So when, when people come together and they have peace in their hearts because God gave it to them and they're reckoning that to be true, that, then when we come together, there, there's a rejoicing in that, there's a comfort in that, and then there's this freedom to be able to move on past the things that would otherwise have been holding us back because we're not at peace. When people come together as the body of Christ, one of the, one of the functions of edification is to comfort and strengthen those that need it. That's usually because they don't have peace on something going on. That's life, and so we can deal with that by God's grace. And there's a function that the body performs to help strengthen and comfort and encourage in that way. But... The instruction then, again, the ideal, just like be strong in the Lord, would that we were all strong all the time, but we're not because we're still in this flesh in a sin-cursed world. But the goal is that we would all be strong. Same here. The goal is that the peace of God would rule in our hearts, right? And that we would be thankful. Thankfulness, again, shows up in all three chapters. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. We talked about that in the last one, about being filled with the Spirit. And then the next command is teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, which we talked about on Sunday. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Again, this isn't being polite while you sing, but this is a doctrine, right? This is a teaching. Amen. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, which is an interesting instruction. And that's not just naming it, right? That's like, got the touchdown, pew, did that for Jesus. Like it do, That means the things that you do need to be the things that God has ordained that the people who bear his name do. Amen. That's what that means. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, the guy who has the Lord Jesus, or the guy who is the Lord Jesus, gave you the name of, of him because you're in his body. And so you need to do the things that he wants his body to do. Like give thanks to God, which again has shown up in all three contexts. Amen. We have the uh, earthly relationships with wives and husbands and children's and uh, children's children and parents, and servants and masters again, that we talked about already. I won't uh, belabor that point again. Continue in prayer again. Watch with the same with thank, watching the same with thanksgiving, being watchful, being uh, aware of what's going on around you. Praying again to speak the mystery of Christ as I ought to speak. He starts bringing the personal back into it at the end of the letter, which is understandable and expected. And so he says that he wants the Colossians to pray for him so that he can speak as he ought to speak. We talked about speaking truth in, in Ephesians chapter 5. And so again, we see, it seems redundant, but that was the point of the lesson. It's like, when you zoom out and you see the main things that are being talked about, when in a lot of Paul's letters, but clearly in these three passages, which are specifically about edification of the body of Christ, it's not a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, I know, yeah, it's two pages, right? 
But you could, you could do that same thing with this. And you could start crossing out some of these things that, well, that kind of lumps in here, that lumps in here. And you're going to end up with God wants the body edified, and he wants it done in the right way. Yeah. That's what you're going to end up with, right? Walk in wisdom, redeeming the time so that your hearts can be comforted when you communicate to one another. Very similar. So I, I hope that wasn't too, too much beating a dead horse, but uh, I wanted to give some context to what we talked about on Sunday Amen. with uh, music being a way that the body of Christ could be edified. And now you've got a front and back sheet full of ways that the body can be edified. It's not just music. There's many ways it can be done, and that's not exhaustive either. But those are the, the things that he specifically lists in those three contexts. And there are other places in, in his scripture or in his uh, letters where he talks about uh, how to edify the body. And maybe not quite as at length, but um, that's all there. So we'll go ahead and, uh, and end that tonight. And uh, we'll take any questions or comments that anybody has about God's tools for edification in the body of Christ. Yes, sir.